It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question uh, to the Premier. You know, um, we're at a turning point in Ontario. I know in my heart that Ontario can and will do a lot better. Here, here. This will. Yes, it will. After 10 years of higher taxes, deeper debt, skyrocketing hydro, it's time to turn the corner, Speaker, to a time of lower taxes, more jobs, affordable here, here. hydro, less debt under a million jobs plan. That's what I plan to do. And, Premier, and I see your budget. I mean, pretty well everything now has been leaked by your budget leaking team. It's, um, it appears that you've utterly given up on trying to even pretend to balance the budget. You're going to spend money, you're going to increase tax. You're going to actually increase both the deficit and taxes, which is an incredible feat. So what I see here question. are deeper debt, higher taxes, and higher hydro rates. I have a simple question. Can you tell me one thing that's different about you than Dalton? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Order. Stop the clock. Order. All right, let's get to it. Uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, let me let me just say that uh, tomorrow the Minister of Finance will Remember from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Speaker, that is designed to build opportunity today and to secure the future for the people of the province of Ontario. Mr. And we are while we are working to create jobs, Mr. Speaker, and partner so that those jobs can be created. Member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry, come to order in his proposals to kill jobs, Mr. Speaker, to actually move jobs out of the province. We're working to strengthen pensions and to make sure that people in this province have the prospect of a secure retirement, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition has no intention and, in fact, from seems Prince quite Hastings come to, order. to let people face a future of insecurity, Answer. Mr. Speaker. We're working to build infrastructure in this province, in GTA, Minister in Rural the North, come to order. Speaker, and the Leader Thank you. of the Opposition has no intention. Thank you. Supplementary. I, no, look, I, look, I get it. You don't want to say the M word, McGinty. Uh, I understand that. You didn't answer my question about a single difference between your approach and Dalton McGinty's. Sir Northern, the, the Premier talks about securing the future. Natural resources come to order. After all, the Speaker, all the Premier cares about is securing a future for her Liberal MPPs exactly. and insiders. I understand exactly. it for real people. Yep. It's time we had a Premier who was focused like a laser on job creation, exactly. a team of confident economic managers have put our province back on track. Look, I understand why you want to continue the McGinty record. You were there at the cabinet table. You held senior positions. You should actually be proud of that, that you had senior positions and a big part of the McGinty team. I don't know why you deny it. But I think it's time to end the charade. This should not be about a premier who's looking out for liberals and liliberal insiders. It should not be about a first NDP leader who simply wants to get a That's contract right. extension to prop up the coalition. It's time for change focus on jobs. Premier Thank you. Please. 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 Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, any any premier or quite frankly any leader worth his or her salt would be focused like a laser on making sure that good jobs like those that are coming to the province through open text mr speaker that those jobs came to the province. any leader focused like a laser on the future would make sure that children have the education that they need mr speaker and the post-secondary institutions have the support that they need we are focused Absolutely on the investments that this province needs. And if the leader of the opposition suggests that there is no need for investment in roads and bridges and transit, in education, in talent and skills, if he's suggesting that partnering with industry and business to make sure jobs come to this province, if he's suggesting yes, that's not what's needed, Mr. Speaker, then he's just dead wrong. Yeah. Can you see it, please? 
Order. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, will come to order. A delayed reaction, just trust me. Final supplementary. Speaker Premier, I talk to job creators, I talk to workers each and every day, and what they tell me, they want a fair and level playing field, a chance to succeed. And they like our plan to make hydro affordable, here, here. to focus on private sector job creation, here, here. not more an expensive, bigger government. To actually have a government that spends within its means and to focus on the skilled trades. They're confident they're behind my plan because they want to see hope in Ontario. They want to see people back to work in our province. And I'll tell them this, hope is on its way. Opportunity is coming to our province. Jobs are around the corner. That's my plan. I'll just ask you one thing. Stop with Order. the hydro. Stop with the increased taxes. Stop with the runaway spending. We've had enough of Dalton McGuinty. We don't need his twin. It's time for a bold new path. Focus on jobs and to get Ontario working again. You see that, please. Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just do not believe that picking fights with organized labour, Mr. Speaker, that cancelling full-day kindergarten, that firing education workers and healthcare workers, that that moving away from a, a practice of partnering with industry that has been in place in this province for the decades, from Mr. Leeds Speaker, Grenville, from the order. premier after premier, government after government, conservative, NDP, liberal. All Member from Northumberland, Mr. Speaker, come to order. have partnered with industry to bring business to the province, and yet the Leader of the Opposition says that all of that partnering is not necessary, that we can just stand back as government and we can let those jobs go to other jurisdictions. I just don't believe that that's in the best interest of the province. You do. There's Answer. a real distinction between us, Mr. Speaker, between uh, the Leader of the Opposition and me. I believe that building our future is what we need to do. He believes that tearing down the province will somehow get us there. It Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please. New question. The member from Nepean Carlton. Much, uh, speaker, my question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, for the past two years, uh, we have been looking, as is Ontarians, for the true answers surrounding the cancelled gas plant. So this is what they know, that the Premier signed the Cabinet document authorizing the cancellation of Oakwell. They know that she was the campaign co-chair for the cancellation at Mississauga. They know that she uh, told us the cost was only $40 million. That, far, that was far exceeded. And she also Minister of Citizenship, come to order. All of the documents, which we know we did not. The Premier needs to clear the air because Minister the of Energy, come to order. To know exactly what her and her transition team knew about the alleged destruction of documents in the Premier's office. She's threatened to sue my leader and I uh, in the hopes that she could silence us, but we won't be silenced. Today, our lawyers have sent, have sent the Premier a letter about the preservation of documents in relation to the cover-up, and we're wondering if the Premier will be open and transparent as she professes and provide us with those documentation immediately and today. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask the member uh, to uh, withdraw. Withdraw. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I know the government House Leader will want to uh, speak to the, uh, the details of what's going on in committee, but I will just say, as I have said many times in this House, from the time I, from the moment I came into this job, I was very clear that we would uh, open up the process, that we would provide information as it was asked for. Hundreds of thousands of documents have gone to the committee, Mr. Speaker. I have appeared before the committee twice, and we have changed the we've changed the protocols and the rules around retention of documents. I've made it clear across government that uh, everyone understands what documents need to be preserved, and that is. 
That is because we worked with the Information from Privacy Commission, Mr. Order, Mr. Speaker. Time. And on top of that, we've changed the process around the location of uh, uh, large uh, uh, in energy infrastructure. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to cooperate Answer. with the investigation. We'll continue to cooperate with the committee and make sure that the information that is asked for is made available. Thank you. Well, this wasn't a committee question, and if she wants to cooperate with the committee, she could haul Manette Smith and Tom Allison into our committee rooms as we've requested and as they have denied. But let's get back to the lawsuit and the billion-dollar question of where the money went and why there was deleted documents in her office and during the transition period. If she wants to put this behind her once and for all, we've given her the opportunity. Myself and the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition have asked. We've requested this of her lawyer. Copies of any and all correspondence between the Premier and members of the former Premier Dalton McGuinty uh, and or members of his Minister staff of the Environment come to order. pertaining to any official meetings held by the Premier and the Premier-designate, any and all records pertaining to and identifying the individual staff members who were employed in the Premier's office on January 26, 2013 through to February 10, Question. 2013. The list goes on. Will the Premier do the right thing, release that documentation to our lawyers today so not only can we defend ourselves, but we Thank can you. get to the truth of a what <laughs> Government House Leader and the member from Nipps. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I, I am not, uh, I am not qualified to uh, conduct. <laughs> what he said. Enough said. Thank you. Premier. I am not qualified, nor certainly is the member opposite qualified, to conduct a legal discovery process in this chamber, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. What I will say to the member opposite, and I wanted to answer this part of the question because she mentioned two people, both of whom have agreed to appear before committee, Mr. Speaker. They have agreed the to appear before McKean committee, Carlton and she order. implied that they had not agreed. And I will say again, I will debate Answer. the truth and facts any day. I will not. No, you'll, you'll be returned. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish, please. Debate unfounded allegations. I will debate facts any day. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Order. Final supplementary. The Premier said she wasn't qualified. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, Premier, <laughs> we know that while documents were being destroyed in the Premier's office, she was holding private meetings. On the same day, February 7th, she directed the Auditor General to stand Stop the clock. Of Stop the, clock. The, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will withdraw. Apologize. Apologize. Withdraw that I. Referred to as no, no. Not make any comment. Order. The, mem, mem, the minute, you know, let me finish so I can bring attention to the act, the fact that I'm not happy. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will withdraw. I withdraw. Finish your question, please. 
Hey guys, I guess we've struck a chord. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Let's put this into concept. context. On the same day as hard drives were being wiped in the Premier's office, this Premier was holding a private meeting directing the Auditor General to expand the scope of the gas plant cancellation Whoa. and investigation. We know that her campaign transition chair, uh, Monique Smith, had many conversations with Peter Walsh, the Secretary of Cabinet, about the gas plants. We know that the OPP are continuing House to get deeper and deeper into this scandal and probing it because Question. all of the Liberals, they're refusing not only to speak to our committee, but also to the OPP. If she is not prepared to provide us with the documents, Thank you. Will she call it Thank you. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the member, this is quite frankly appalling, Mr. Speaker. Appalling. The member stood up here and talked about testimony of Peter Wallace. Let me share the testimony of Peter Wallace. April 15, 2013, we did not express any advice with respect to the management of political records or the hard drives or the emails that associated with the former saying. Premier's office with the transition team. The area that we did not cover because we had no visibility into it whatsoever was the management and the practice of the former Premier's office with respect to its records management, whether it be hard drives or other mechanisms of its political records. That is what the Secretary of Cabinet talked about in terms that, of that his relationship the with the transition team. That is the truth, Mr. Speaker. Answer. The truth is that members of the Liberal Party, members of this government, have agreed to appear in Thank front you. of the committee, unlike the Conservative candidate. Thank you. The new question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said, I quote, as soon as we knew that there was a problem with the girders in Windsor, we stopped the building, unquote. But three months prior to that, Speaker, there was a heated email exchange between senior officials about. Order. Stop the clock. The uh, member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, I'm looking for quiet. Please finish. But prior to that, Speaker, three months prior, there was a heated email exchange between senior officials about the safety of the girders. The Ministry of Transportation project lead for the parkway, Fausto Naturelli, wrote to Infrastructure Ontario saying, and I quote, I have no confidence in you or, frankly, your organization to act in the provincial interest. We need a conversation with more senior Question. officials, unquote. Is the Premier telling Ontarians these senior officials who regularly meet with deputy ministers and had this seated discussion about the girders Thank never you. raised concerns with anyone? Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'm, uh, I'm just once again going to go through the timeline because uh, I think it's important that we deal with the facts. As we've explained many times to the NDP, the issues brought up at the meetings that uh, the leader of the third party is referring to had to do with non-compliance as opposed to safety, Mr. Speaker. So here are the dates. On June 14, 2013, the minister's office staff were first briefed on the safety, on the safety and durability issues regarding girders on the Herb Gray Parkway. On June 19, 2013, the minister was briefed on the issue of girders. He immediately took action to cease the installation of the girders. On July 22, 2013, the minister called on a group of independent experts to look into the issue and make recommendations to the government. On no November 1, 2013, the Windsor-Essex Mobility Group and the Parkway Infrastructure Construction Constructors announced that they are they were rejecting and Answer. replacing the girders at no cost to Ontario taxpayers. That's what happened, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker. We now know that in the fall of 2012, the Canadian Precast and Pre-Stressed Concrete Institute expressed concerns that we know were discussed in the minister's office. They wrote to say, and I quote, if non-conforming girders supplied by non-certified precasters result in future structural or durability deficiencies that affect public safety, this will impact our industry significantly, unquote. Now, is the Premier going to stand by her minister who says that safety concerns were never raised? Mr. Speaker, I have, I have gone 
through the chronology of when the minister was informed about and, and briefed on safety and durability issues, Mr. Speaker, and I know because the minister and I spoke that he took action right away, and that was action that he took because I supported him in doing that, Mr. Speaker, and making sure that the, the fact that there was a safety issue meant that we would take action. Those girders have been removed, those safety issues have been dealt with, Mr. Speaker, and at no cost to the Ontario taxpayer because it was part of the contract. So, yes, I stand by the process and I stand by my minister's decision. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Premier said yesterday that the minister's office staff were first briefed on the safety and durability issues regarding the girders on the parkway on June 14, 2013, and that the minister was briefed on June 19, 2013. But documents show a decision was made by the minister's office on February 14 not to intervene in the girder issue. Now, can the Premier explain why she's saying one thing and the documents are saying something completely different? Different speaker. Mr. Speaker, you, you know, the fact is that uh, there were those meetings took place. Obviously, there was not sufficient information during the, the time periods that the leader of the uh, third party is talking about to make definitive recommendations on safety. There were issues on compliance, Mr. Speaker. I've been through the, uh, the the chronology of the meetings that took place, and I've made it very clear that as soon as the minister uh, knew that there were safety concerns, action was taken. Those girders were removed, Mr. Speaker, and they were were removed at the cost of the company. They were not removed at the expense of the taxpayers of the province. And that is exactly what should have happened, Mr. Speaker. And if the leader of the third party is suggesting that we would put people's safety at time. risk, that is just not the case, Mr. Speaker. We acted as soon as we knew that there were safety concerns. Thank you. New question. On this side of the third party. House, to the Premier, Speaker, we on this side of the House have learned to actually rely on the documents, not the word of witness. Yeah. Documents show that substandard girders and installation pan of panels is not the only concern, Speaker, that senior ministry engineers have with the parkway. Is the Premier prepared to tell us what other structural problems exist on this parkway, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, you know, I am I am very, very pleased that the contract that was put in place was designed such that uh, an issue like this could be dealt with in the way that it was, Mr. Speaker. I'm very, very pleased that the safety of the people of Ontario was protected because action was taken as quickly as it was, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, that those girders were removed as soon as we knew that they, there was a potential that there was a safety issue. So I would think that the leader of the third party should should actually agree that it is a very good thing that those girders were removed. Is it, it should agree that before, before more of them were put in, Mr. Speaker, we stopped that process. We stopped the construction so that the, uh, the testing could be done. Once that testing was done, Mr. Speaker, the girders were removed at the expense of the company, and that's exactly how it should have happened, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Her government documents show that senior ministry engineers are concerned about bearings, protection boards, waterproofing, and poor mixture of concrete. These are not isolated in one area, Speaker. These structural deficiencies cover different stretches of the parkway. Now, what is the Premier prepared to do to ensure the safety of the parkway and the tens of thousands of people on both sides of the border that will be using this road each and every day? Well, Mr. Speaker, what we are prepared to do, and I, you know, I think that uh, the uh, the leader of the third party is uh, bringing forward accusations that are unfounded, Mr. Speaker. What we will do is we will continue to work with the engineers to make sure that at each stage, if there are concerns, that we will take action, just as we did with the girders, Mr. Speaker. Exactly as we did with the girders. That as non-compliance issues, if they transform into safety issues, Mr. Speaker, then we will take action and make sure that the number one priority is the safety of the people of this province, as we did with the girders, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. 
Senior engineers have flagged a variety of structural issues, Speaker. These are not unfounded accusations. These are senior engineers who have found these problems. Issues including bearings that did not meet code, meet code requirements. Internal uh, correspondence shows, I quote, this situation is not unlike the girders issue. It is true that these bearings are being installed and are not approved. End quote. Bearings are what the bridges on the parkway depend on for their stability. How can the people of this province trust this government on transit and infrastructure projects worth billions of dollars when this project, a major international border crossing, one, of the, one that the Premier used to brag about negotiating, has so many serious, serious safety problems? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I, as I have said, there, there is nothing more important than the safety of the people of Ontario. And so we will continue to work with the experts, with the engineers, to make sure that uh, all of the parts that go into the building of the, uh, the parkway are safe, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has the safest roads in North America. We will continue to make sure that the Herb Gray Parkway is part of that. But Mr. Speaker, I just want to say that there is going to be a budget introduced tomorrow. And Mr. Speaker, I, I have been trying to get a meeting with the leader of the third party since February to have a conversation about how we might work together to pass the budget, Mr. Speaker. My hope is that she will agree to meet with me, Mr. Speaker, so that we can uh, look at a path forward. I know that the uh, leader of the opposition has Answer. no interest in working with us, Mr. Speaker, but I hope that we will have an opportunity to meet because, Mr. Speaker, a lot hangs in the balance. A lot hangs in the balance, including, Mr. Speaker, continuing Answer. to be able to build infrastructure in this province. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Order. New question, the member for Lambton Kennedy. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Premier, in Saturday's London Free Press, your Minister of Health claimed that she didn't know why the Ministry of Health used an irrevocable trust agreement which would have allowed two Liberal-friendly groups to pocket up to $40 million, this despite the fact that she personally signed off on two separate renewals. Premier, I have since learned that this government set up irrevocable trust arrangements in a number of ministries over the past 10 years. Premier, will you immediately order every ministry to disclose how many trusts were created, what organizations ran them, and how much taxpayers' money was involved and possibly pocketed by groups that may be affiliated with the Working Families Coalition? Thank you. Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I think that the um, I think the member opposite is talking about the uh, nursing retention fund. That's right. Um, and when we took office, uh, hospitals were running massive de deficits, and they were signaling uh, layoff of layoffs of nurses as a result of uh, PC cuts, Mr. Speaker, and that was unacceptable to us. So um, we took action to reverse that drain, Mr. Speaker, on our nursing workforce, and uh, we put strict controls on the funding that was put in place in terms of of the uh, nursing retention fund. The Minister of Health has been working to uh, see what we can do to make sure that the nursing retention fund is utilized, Mr. Speaker. Um, but you know, I think that really what the uh, what the member opposite is doing once again is undermining the work of organized labour in the province. That's really that's really what this is about. We put in place support for keeping nurses in the province. What he wants to do, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, is to undermine that relationship. Thank you. The uh, member from Sarnia Lambton will come to order. Supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, we know that it is extremely unusual to uh, use an irrevocable trust to fund government programs. Premier, this morning I met with Ontario's Auditor General in follow-up to my letter requesting that her office immediately launch audits on all irrevocable trusts that this Liberal, Liberal government has set up and maintained. 
One of the documents I turned over to the Auditor General is confirmation from a Ministry of Finance official that over the past 10 years, these types of funds were set up in at least seven government ministries, Whoa. including the ministries of Education, Whoa. Aboriginal Whoa. Affairs and Agriculture and Food, three ministries that you know quite well. Sounds Premier, like will you confirm this morning that you have never set up or helped maintain an irrevocable trust Question. during your time in Cabinet? Thank you. Nice. Mr. Speaker, the, the point of the nursing retention fund was to make sure well, that, that's, that's what the question is about. It's about it's about the purpose of setting up such a fund. In, I'll have to take direct action, I will. Finish. So the the <laughs> the uh, member from the P and Carlton is warned. The member from uh, Eglinton Lawrence may be one. Carry on, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In January, the minister, the minister met with the nursing organizations to uh, to talk about how the uh, uh, the fund was being managed and to make sure that it could be used in the best way possible to retain nurses. That's what it was about, Mr. Speaker. And what the the reason the member opposite is is asking this question, as far as I can tell, is that he wants to undermine the reputation of confidence of these groups. His quote from uh, April 28th: "Acting Premier, the most generous possible input." interpretation of the nursing retention fund boondoggle is that the RNA, RPNAO and Answer. ONA are utterly incompetent project managers and cannot be trusted to serve as stewards of taxpayer Thank money. You. So, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. Stop the clock. <laughs> Given some thought, I'm going to ask the member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex to withdraw and the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound to withdraw. One at a time, please. I withdraw. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. <laughs> Speaker, <coughs> Premier Wynne promised that her government would be open and transparent and that her ministers would correspond on government business using official channels, including ministerial email accounts. Mm. Despite the Premier's claims of a more open government, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure regularly corresponds on sensitive ministerial business with senior Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Infrastructure, and Infrastructure Ontario staff, as well as government legal counsel using his Liberal caucus email accounts. Why are there no emails at all Question. from the minister's email account regarding the girders as part of the 1,200-page FOI request submitted on August the 12th last year? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, um, both I and the minister have answered the questions around the uh, chronology of how we took action on the girders, Mr. Speaker. We've answered that question a number of times. I will continue to answer the question. The, the primary concern is that the safety of the people of Ontario be protected, Mr. Speaker. The primary concern is the one that motivated uh, the actions as soon as the minister was aware that there were safety concerns. Um, the construction was stopped. The girders were tested. That the girders were removed, Mr. Speaker, at no cost to the people of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, that is how the system should work. And I would just say that the uh, the member members well aware of this because he was included in the process. He was brought up to speed. He was part of the discussion with yes, the sir. minister, so he knew all along how the girders were being dealt with, Mr. Speaker, and the safety concerns and the actions that we were taking. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier. I've seen the evidence. I've seen the documents. I know what's in there. Don't try to pull that bluff with me. According to government documents, there are only four email chains that included messages from the minister and the girders between June and August of 
2013. The four second-hand emails were the only correspondence the minister sent about the girders that we received in the documents included in the FOI request. Is the Premier telling the people of Ontario that she believes the minister only exchanged four emails about the Herb Gray Parkway while it was going off the rails, or was he purposely concealing public information? is reading the email because he received it through uh, Freedom of Information, Mr. Speaker. And government business is subject to Freedom of Information no matter where it takes place. What I can tell you is that the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure was having regular meetings. He was having face-to-face -face meetings. He was on top of this issue, Mr. Speaker, and he was making sure that he understood what the concerns are and that he was taking appropriate action. That's what he was doing. That's why the girders were removed. That's why the safety issues were dealt with. That's why, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the safety of the people of Ontario is preserved because of the actions that the minister took, because of the meetings that he was yes, attending. Thank you. Any the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, as we all know, the Ring of Fire is a historic economic opportunity for Northern Ontario, but it's bigger than that. We can, just like a, a rising tide raises all boats, the Ring of Fire is going to raise not just the North, not just Ontario, but all of Canada. And that's why it's a shame that the federal Conservatives have completely Order. abdicated all responsibility on this file, but we here, the Liberal government, continues to show leadership. Minister, I understand that you and our Northern colleagues this past Monday made a major announcement. Order. Stop. No, keep the clock going. Sorry, keep the clock going. The member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order. Carry on. Finish. I know that the minister and our northern colleagues this past Monday made a major announcement regarding the Ring of Fire, and could he please tell us more about that? Thank yes, you. please thank tell you. us. I want to thank the member for uh, Mississauga East Cooks for the question. And, and indeed, this past Monday, I was very uh, excited to announce, alongside my colleagues, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Minister of Natural Resources, uh, that our government uh, is prepared to make a commitment of up to $1 billion to develop all seasonal infrastructure in the Ring of Fire. Mr. Speaker, we are making tremendous progress on this multi generational project that will not only see benefits for the North, but for the entire province and indeed for the country. Mr. Premier, uh, just this past week, Speaker, Premier Wynn and I uh, also signed a historic uh, landmark agreement with uh, the Matawa First Nation communities that uh, will not only ensure that First Nations and the province can work together to advance Answer. opportunities, but will also ensure that their communities significantly benefit from the Ring of Fire opportunity. So we're very excited about it, Speaker. A great commitment from the province. Thank you. The federal government needs to come Thank in now. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. A billion dollars. Wow. If only the federal government is listening. Uh, and I know, Mr. Speaker, that at, once this project Remember gets from going, Chatham, Kent, it's Essex, going to we'll come to order. right in my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville. So, Minister, could you, through the Speaker, tell us how you're driving this project forward? Great question. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much again. My thanks to the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. We're very proud of our government's commitment to this project, and we said many times in the past we were prepared to make a very significant investment in uh, the Ring of Fire infrastructure. And now that we have announced our uh, our financial commitment to the project, we are indeed providing clarity and uh, making incredible progress on this multi-generational project. And in order to maximize on the Ring of Fire's potential, Speaker, uh, not just for the province but for the entire country. We need the federal government to follow through on what they, they have said many times. This is a project of national significance and national benefit. The expectation we have, Mr. Speaker, is that they will be a partner in this project. They will match the dollars that we're committed to paying, and that they will help with the two major infrastructure pieces, the industrial part and community access, which is very Answer. important to First Nations. Uh, my focus, Mr. Speaker, is to get the federal government on, on board. If they're on board, this is a better Thank project. You. It's a Bigger project. Thank you. 
New question, the member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Premier, the auditor's report on the Ministry of Citizenship year-end slush fund made it clear to your government that the availability of grants must be communicated to all potential recipients. But we discovered that as Minister of Agriculture, you've been giving away year-end grants to hand-picked companies. Mm -hmm. There was no publicly available application. In fact, companies were only invited to apply because of their relationship with staff in your ministry. Yep. Minister, do you believe that the rules of financial accountability don't apply just because you're trying to get money out before year-end? Yeah, I think that's the answer. You know, I, I actually would have expected that, uh, that the member opposite and a, a former Minister of Agriculture would have understood that it's very important that we work with food processors and with the agriculture community to make sure that they can make the investments that are necessary. So uh, the investments that we're making through the Local Food Act, for example, Mr. Speaker, I was at a, I was at a bakery just on the weekend. Uh, the, the applications had come in, Mr. Speaker. And uh, and those those grants, I think it's over 60 grants, Mr. Speaker, to uh, promote local food and make sure that make sure that they have the ca the capacity to grow their enterprise, Mr. Speaker. And you know what, uh, Mr. Speaker, these are businesses all over the province. They are businesses that have a wide range of whether it's bakeries, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's local. Farms, farmers markets and local uh, food strategies all of that mr speaker promotes local food allows food processors and food producers to Thank do you. better in the province i would think he'd be supportive of that mr speaker supplementary mr. speaker premier you must have missed the original question about the which grants i'm talking about premier these grants included a million dollars given to a distillery even though their project didn't create a single new job over six million went to two companies that had almost completed their building projects on their own. This is the, the worst type, picking time. winners and losers. Competitors had no idea the grants even existed and couldn't apply. They were reviewed by a panel. They were reviewed by a panel whose membership isn't public and then approved by Minister you without personally. Portfolio, come to order. Premier, at any time during this process, handpicking. Did it occur to you that it was wrong to do it this way? Sounds like a trick. You see the face? You see the face? Thank you. Trigger. Mr. Speaker, so it has made. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the member opposite has made a couple of allegations. If he's talking about um, McLaren's Distillery, that was uh, that was a grant that was made through the local food uh, fund, Mr. Speaker. If he's talking about uh, Hiram Walker and Sons, a um, uh, million dollars that actually did create 10 new jobs, Mr. Speaker. And Hiram Walker currently supports Ontario's agriculture sector by purchasing 4.2 million bushels. Well, you know, the folks who work at Hiram Walker think that's pretty good, and the people who work at St. Albert, Mr. Speaker, St. Albert cheese. Cooperative. They think that's pretty good too, Mr. Speaker. That they will be they will be able to create 10 new jobs. Uh, the people at Thomas Canning, Mr. Speaker, with the three million dollar uh, investment, creating 40 new jobs. The people who have those jobs, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and those companies think that it's a very good thing that they have a government that works with them and is an ongoing conversation with the sector to find those companies that need the support to help them to grow, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. They think that's a good idea. And I do too. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in their rush to put casinos in communities that don't even want them, the Liberal government dealt a blow to the horse racing families in Fort Erie and across the province. The Audio General report found that the Liberal government OLG privatization plan didn't have a clear business case and they failed to consult communities. The report also points out that the OG net profits are down over $600 million from previous years and that the government doesn't really know what effects canceling the slots at racetrack program will have on the industry. Do you continue to stand by your misguided OLG privatization plan that decreased profits, threatened to put casinos in municipalities that didn't want them, and that almost destroyed the horse racing industry?
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, when I came into this job, I made it clear that I was very concerned about the fate of the horse racing industry, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows that uh, Fort Erie uh, Live Racing Consortium have signed a three-year agreement. This is great news for Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. Jim Tiber said it was a brilliant move. So, Mr. Speaker, we have made it clear that investing $500 million over the next five years to put the horse racing industry on a, a solid and stable uh, track to sustainability, Mr. Speaker, that that is what we will do. And I know, I know that the member opposite really understands that the decisions that were made about Fort Erie were the right ones. That the community was the community was very eager, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that these uh, these agreements were put in place. They have been, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased that the horse racing industry has a season this year Answer. and in the, the mid and the long term will have those seasons, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the horse is out of the barn when it comes to the failed Liberal plan for oil OLG. And horse racing families are stuck with empty stalls on farms across the province. Even the Auditor Audio General says the government modernization plan nearly put down the horse racing industry. Is government finally ready to apologize to the horse people in Fort Erie and guarantee a long-term future for our historic track? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, exactly what the member opposite is talking about is what I have been working on since we came into office, since I came into this office, Mr. Speaker. I said that we needed to take a second look at what was happening with the horse racing industry. My predecessor had set up a panel of Elmer Buchanan, John Snowblin, John Wilkinson. We took those recommendations. That's what the $500 million is about, Mr. Speaker. I want the horse racing industry to have a bright future. I want the integration of horse racing with gaming in this province, Mr. Speaker, and I know that that is a challenging process, but I want the member opposite to know that I am on it. I am working to make sure that that integration happens because that is what will that's what will ensure the long-term success of the horse racing industry. If gaming and horse racing Answer. can be integrated, you know that's the case and you know that that's the way forward. Thank you. Question the member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. We know that Ontario's publicly funded education system stands as one of the best in the world. The progress that we've made is the result of dedicated work and vision of our government working hand-in-hand -hand with the education community to create a world-class system. Recently, Mr. Speaker, the Minister engaged with my constituents and many others across the province to reach a consensus on a vision that will carry our province forward. The results of these consultations was recently released in the re Renewed Vision document. Can the minister please update this House on the Renewed Vision? Here, here. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa South. Speaker, we do have a lot to be proud of when we look at our accomplishments in education. Over the past 10 years, we've been able to raise the graduation rate from 68% to 83%. 71% of our children in grades 3 and 6 are meeting the provincial standard. That's up from 54% uh, 10 years ago. But we know that building on that success, there's more to do. We need to move our system from great to excellent. And that's why on April 9th, we released a renewed vision for education in Ontario entitled Achieving Excellence, a Renewed Vision for Education in Ontario. The document outlines our four renewed goals for education, achieving excellence, Answer. ensuring ex equity, uh, student well-being, and enhancing public confidence. As the member mentioned, Thank we have all over the province. And Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for bringing us up to speed on the renewed vision. Mr. Speaker, it is important for us to continue to look forward on how we can take our system from great to excellent. Here, here. Excellence, excellence is preparing our students to be personally successful, economically productive, and actively engaged as global citizens. Here, here. This renewed vision is about the next 10 years and beyond, Mr. Speaker, and we have an opportunity to seize on the progress we have made and build on it to create a brighter future for our children. Technology has changed the, the classroom tremendously, impacting the way students learn and teachers deliver their lessons. Directly, directly impacting their job prospects as they graduate. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister update us on what our government is doing to support the renewed vision 
in creating a modern, innovative, Question. and responsive system. Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And one of the things we heard in our consultations when we talked to business, post-secondary, not-for-profit uh, agencies and communities was a common theme that the impact of technology is playing in our classrooms, and especially with younger digitally native students. So when we looked at our vision, Speaker, uh, we knew that we had to look at technology, the use of technology, and I was pleased to announce our support for the renewed vision by investing over $150 million over three years to give learners and educators access to new technology in the classroom. Speaker, this funding will support Support improved student achievement through innovative teaching and learning practices. It will help us take best practice on how yes, to use technology effectively and spread it throughout the province. Thank These you. improve. Thank you. New no question, the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, the Ontario Energy Board reported tomorrow's hydro rake is because renewables coming on the grid over the next 12 months. Renewable energy producers, including wind, solar and biomass, provide 10 per cent of the total supply of electricity, yet receive 31 per cent of the subsidies that ratepayers must provide in the form of global adjustment. The total bill for the average customer will be nearly double the Bank of Canada's core inflation cost forecast. Minister, the people of Ontario, as well as hospitals, curling clubs, Royal Canadian Legions, to name a few, cannot afford higher energy rates Senior. simply Next because thing. you refuse to acknowledge your mismanagement of our electricity system. Yeah. Why are you doing nothing to ensure that Ontarians are able to pay their energy bills and preventing Senior. future rate hikes? Question. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I do have some numbers on electricity rates in the province of Ontario. Uh, as I've indicated previously, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Quebec Hydro annually does a survey in North American cities of electricity prices. And by the, at the end of 2013, the last year that they've compiled it, uh, I'll give you the rates, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the rate per uh, kilowatt hour in Ottawa, 12.39 cents. Toronto, 12.48 cents. Edmonton, Mr. Speaker, 13.9. Calgary, Mr. Speaker, 14.8. Halifax, 15.45. And they often refer to U.S. jurisdictions as having much better competitive rates than we do, Mr. Speaker. In Detroit, it's 15.54. Wow. Boston, it's 16.5. New York is 21.75. Mr. Speaker, our rates are competitive. Yes, sir, thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, clearly the big liberal wheel keeps on turning, or more appropriately, spinning. But we need to be serious here for a minute. Back to the minister. On April 20. Listen. On April 27th, listen, on April 27th, a small airplane crashed on the site of Nextera's Energy South Dakota Wind Energy Center, killing all four passengers. This is very, very serious. Four people were killed because they crashed into Nextera's wind project in South Dakota. An Associated Press report notes that one of the wind turbines was in fact damaged. Turbines have been ordered to be taken down around Chatham Airport, but nothing has happened. Samsung is throwing money around and wanting to change approaches to the Concordant Airport, yet my letters of concern are not satisfactorily addressed. Hollywood Airport is threatened by industrial wind turbines as well, and Peterborough Question. Airport has stated that wind turbines are threatening the safety of pilots. When, Minister, are you going to admit that the siting of industrial Thank wind you. turbines has been not properly Thank done? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, our renewable process and the Ontario Power Authority has a process. Uh, 
uh, contracts are awarded, Mr. Speaker. They go through a process, including, including the RIA or the environmental assessment process. Uh, there's an opportunity for all objectors to come before uh, the Ministry of the Environment to review that, Mr. Speaker. And even after that, there's an appeal. And even after that, there's a judicial review that's possible, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. You know what? There are huge developments that take place across this province for our buildings, for our real estate developments, Mr. Power. Speaker. They have an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board. They can go to judicial review. The same legal rights that exist for all these other types of developments exist for wind, Mr. Speaker. It's fair, it's reasonable, and Mr. Speaker, yes, they plan on cancelling 250 contracts, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to put the province out risk to $20 billion in legal claims. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex will come to order. New question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Every time this Liberal government fails to deliver for Ontarians, they just make more announcements and empty promises. Today in London, they're doing it again on transit. The Premier has promised Londoners high-speed rail, but it's hard to take her seriously because her own ministers can't get their stories straight. The Transportation Minister has boasted publicly about bullet trains travelling at 320 kilometres per hour, but the Education Minister says it certainly won't be bullet trains, and she honestly doesn't know what her colleague was referring to. Speaker, will the Premier level with the people of London and let us know which Liberal cabinet minister we should believe? Please. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here's, here's the thing. What we know is that there needs to be better transportation in this province. We know there needs to be transit in all parts of the province, including the corridor from Toronto to London, Mr. Speaker. So the announcement that the minister is making today is a very important one. I know, Mr. Speaker, that the connection between Toronto and Kitchener-Waterloo, the high-tech hub where OpenText is bringing all those jobs, Mr. Speaker, and then between Kitchener-Waterloo and London, we know that that is a very important corridor for business in this province. So we are making the investment. We are going to work with the private sector, Mr. Speaker. We are going to work with the communities to make sure to make sure that those connections are put in place. What I would like, Mr. Answer. Speaker, is I would very much like to be able to have a conversation with the leader of the third party about what parts of the budget, what parts of transit investment, what parts of infrastructure investment she might be willing to support. Haven't been able Thank to have you. that conversation, but I'm very much looking forward to it, Mr. Thank Speaker. Speaker, as much as the people of the London community want to believe they, get high, they will get high-speed rail, they just can't seem to trust this Liberal government. Like all Ontarians, they know that empty Liberal promises don't create jobs or provide transit relief. And they know that if the Premier was serious about her latest scheme, she would have told us the costs and timeline. Speaker, it's time for the government to stop playing games with the people, people's lives in London and start providing real transit relief to families and businesses. When will the Premier admit she has no idea how much high-speed rail will cost and has no plan to make it happen in London? Good Mr. Speaker, well, I really, I have to say, coming from a party that has no plan on building transit, Mr. Speaker, that's pretty rich. So, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, if, the, if the leader of the. Well, okay, then it's a. What I would suggest to the member opposite is that she look at the she look at the projects that are underway if she wants to look at our reliability in terms of delivering. I would suggest she go to the Eglinton Crosstown and look at what the boring machine is doing there, Mr. Speaker. Look at the progress. Look at the progress on the uh, on the um, uh, the Union Pearson Rail Line, Mr. Speaker. That she look at the York University Answer. line. That she go to Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, and look at the work that's being done there because there is building happening in this province because of our commitments to transit. We will follow through. 
They don't have a plan, and we will be we will make those trains run. New question. The member from Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Res residents of my community of Scarborough Southwest, including myself, are glad to know that our government is committed to protecting our pets and animals from abuse and neglect. Our government created the strongest animal welfare legislation in all of Canada that increased the SPCA's agents' ability to inspect and enforce the law. The government also strengthened penalties, including jail up to two years, fines up to $60,000, and potential lifetime ownership ban for animal cruelty. But, Speaker, some of my constituents are concerned that cases of animal cruelty may be going unreported. Speaker, can the minister tell us more? of what is the government is doing to make sure our pets and animals are being protected. Thank you. The Minister of uh, Community Safety and Strength. Thank practice. you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And, and, and as proud owner of a dog named Bella, a mix uh, Husky and German Shepherd, she'll be happy that she's mentioned in Hensard now. Uh, I, I thank the member from Scarborough Southwest for asking a very important question. And I want to thank my predecessor, the, the Minister of Attorney General, for all her hard work on this very important file, Speaker. Just last year, our government announced $5.5 million in annual funding to the OSPC to enhance their abilities to enforce the OSPCA Act. This funding, Speaker, will help OSPCA to establish a free, toll-free, 24-7 hotline and centralized dispatch service to report animal cruelty. It will create a team of specially trained investigators, Speaker, whose respons responsibilities will include cracking down on puppy and kitten mills. Also, Speaker, it will deliver specialized livestock training for investigators in the agriculture sector yes, and conduct regular inspections of zoos and aquariums and establish and maintain a zoo registry to support twice yearly inspections. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you uh, for that answer, Mr. Um, Minister. Uh, my family owns three uh, abandoned cats. Uh, Buffy, or Buffalino as I call him, Misha, Misha and Jack. There's a lot of animal lovers in Ontario, and we know that most people take good care of their animals. However, there are troubling instances of abuse and neglect that cannot be tolerated. So when someone feels that an animal is in distress, it's important for those people to call the OSPCA. Mr. Speaker, through the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, I think the 24 Centre Call Centre will be an important tool for the OSPCA agents, as it will enable them to respond to situations of animal abuse and or neglect in a reasonable time frame. Speaker, can we expect for the 24th Centre Call Centre to be up and running? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, uh, 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 this is a very important issue. Uh, protecting our animals and preventing cruelty to animals is very important to all Ontarians, Speaker. And I'm really proud that the o OSPCA made this very important announcement last Monday by launching the 24 7 call center. We are, Speaker, we should be very uh, proud of the fact that we are the first government to provide the support necessary to help launch such an important initiative. Now there is a free, toll-free, 24-hour phone number available to report suspected animal cruelty. If you believe that animal is in distress, call 310-SPCA. It's 310-SPCA any time of the day any day of the year, Speaker. Yes, this is just another example of how we are enhancing the responsiveness of investigators to animal welfare complaints for urban, rural, and northern communities. Good question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question today is to the Premier. Uh, Premier, there's a gap in the child welfare system that leaves 16- and 17-year-old children who find themselves in need for the first time without access to services. This systemic flaw creates street kids who have increased rates of hospitalizations, incarceration, and failing in school. These forgotten children under 18 are having their human rights violated under your watch. I'm surprised, actually, you haven't been sued yet. Bill 88, the Youth Right to Care Bill, closes this service gap and protects our youth. As a self-proclaimed social justice premier, explain to us why you're stalling through reading of this bill. Premier. 
and Youth Services. The Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question with respect to our youth and, and respect to what we're doing to protect our youth and with respect to Bill 88. Yes, Bill 88 has gone through standing committee, and yes, we've, uh, we've had that discussion. But let me just say very clearly, we've had this discussion many times in terms of what this government is doing, in terms of their commitment to our children, in terms of our commitment to vulnerable youth in our community, in terms of listening to our youth, the youth leaving care recommendations that came forward and everything that we're doing to ensure that they can transition into adulthood and have all the same opportunities that every child has across the province, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, yes, we are committed to our youth and we will continue to do what we need to do to ensure all our youth are protected across the province. Premier, with due respect, this question is for you because you have the power to make this change. This bill came directly from the children in care. These right. came from the children uh, youth in care hearings earlier two years ago. You're now responsible for the only jurisdiction in the developed world that neglects these children. I can only draw the conclusion, Premier, that you don't care. These kids end up getting picked up by high-cost reactionary services eventually, jail, hospital, rehab services, or even worse. If they're lucky, they end up in adult welfare. We need to ensure that every child under 18, full stop, has access to child welfare system and the best opportunity to succeed in the future. Stop banking on a possible election to save you from acting as your social justice premier. Do the right thing right now. Right now. Tell us when these youth will become a priority for you. Not for your minister, not for your house leader, for you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let's have this discussion. It's never too late to have somebody leave. Finish, please. Thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the bill coming forward, we know how that works in terms of government House leaders having the discussion in terms of bills coming forward into this House. But let me just talk about some of the stuff that we have done on behalf of those recommendations that came out of that report. And I think everyone knows what we have done. We've raised monthly financial support for our children. We're developing mentorship Member opportunities. From Hamilton East, we have new I mean, youth Hamilton and transition Mountain come to order. workers helping our youth. We have absolutely been listening to our youth, to the recommendations for that they have brought forward. We will continue to do so, and we will continue to do what we need to do to protect all our youth. Thank you. The, uh, the uh, member for uh, York Simcoe on a point of order. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my point of order is that I have an overdue uh, order paper question, and it's to uh, the Ministry of the Environment. Would the Minister of the Environment please give the status of the cleanup order and other orders to comply your ministry has issued to the Thane smelter in Georgina in the riding of York Simcoe? Thank you. It is my understanding that indeed that is overdue, and I would defer to the Minister of the Environment. Mr. Mr. Speaker, at the request of one of my favourite members particularly, would we'll be happy to comply at the very earliest opportunity. <laughs> um, while this process is going on, I would love the members to take a break on the heckling. <laughs> including those that want to do my job. The member from Malaburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, and I have a point of order to the Premier. Do you approve of one of your ministers calling one of the members of this legislature a windbag? Yeah. It's not a point of order. This, uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.